addiction way back when, way before everybody started feeding pollen substitutes like crazy, and that was, how long ago was that, Gordy? Uh, 2002. A while ago. And now he's working with uh, Paramount Farms, and he's their bee biologist, and he looks at the orchard bees, he looks at planting forage along the orchards, and I think these, I think that's a, a way we need to go with all our almond growers planting some different forage, mustard, and things like that, and he's on the forefront of, of that kind of, of uh, research. And so I think it's really great to have a guy like that tied up with an almond grower that can uh, give them some information about really how hard it is to be beekeepers, um, yet they bought bees, so I don't know. I don't think you're doing it and giving them the, the real answer there, Gordy. He didn't listen. I, I'd like to hear uh, what's going on with that as well. If you, if you'd like to share that with us. So, Gordy, what up? Uh. <coughs> I'm sure my phone is on. Everyone's phone on silent. silent. This is a meeting where I, I got up and several years ago, and I've told the story too many times, but I got up and the moderator said, make sure you turn your phones on vibrate, turn your phones off. So I got up and I said, my phone's on vibrate, I put it in my pocket. And a couple wise guys in the audience knew my phone number and just started dialing. <laughs> and the phone was in my pocket, buzzing, buzzing, buzzing. Don't think about it. You were smiling. All right, let's see this. Oh, there's the laser, and there's the, the okay. Well, let me, let me uh, get started here. My name's Gordy Wardell. I work for Paramount Farming, now Wonderful Orchards. Uh, and Wonderful Orchards now has a division of, of uh, the company called Wonderful Bees. Now, if you're expecting Den Dennis Van Engelsdorf, I'm not Dennis, that's in the other room, okay? So I don't, I won't be embarrassed if you get up and leave, so. <laughs> so, anyway, I'm the, uh, the bee biologist or the director of pollination operations, whatever you want to call me, for Wonderful Orchards. Uh, we typically bring in about 90,000 colonies a year into the, uh, we have about 46,000 acres of almonds, bring in about 90,000 colonies. And we're in the process of starting to own some of our own bees. And it's going to be a four-year, five-year process, but we anticipate eventually growing, you know, close to owning enough, if not all of the bees we'll be needing uh, for that operation, which is a pretty scary thing. Mm -hmm. I, when they told me, my boss called me up in one day, several years ago, and he says, Gordy, what does a beehive cost? I said, about, this time of year, about 150 bucks. I said, do you want one, Joe? I'll set one up for you. Yeah. Goes, no, no, we're going to get into bees. And I just remember looking at the phone thinking, no, you don't mean that. <laughs> it's much easier renting. <laughs> but we're, we're getting into it, and we're learning a lot in the process. And um, we'll discuss some of those things in a minute here. Um, and that's what it's all about, is keeping those girls flying. I promise that's the only animation I have, this whole thing. <laughs> um, this is, this is what's going on. Pollination prices have been going up about 10% a year uh, for the last 10, 15 years. About 10% increase a year. And honey prices have gone up as well. What's, what's interesting, as the demand increases for honeybee colonies, the, the amount of colonies has been pretty flat really zero growth in the number of colonies available. And, uh, but that we're losing 35% a year, Katie? We're losing 35% of our colonies a year, but the, the resource is flat. Which means that all you beekeepers out there, reach back, give yourself a pat on the back, because you're doing what nobody in no other industry could do. Imagine any other, any other industry that could sustain 35% losses and still maintain the resource for pollination. You guys are doing a great job. And it's, it's all, you know, it's by changing your, your model for, for your, uh, 
your, your business model, how you change your business, you know? It used to be a beekeeper would, uh, two thirds of his income would be from honey and one third from pollination, it's, it's reversed now. It's the other way around. So that's what's, that's what's going on with supply and it's because of that, the risk in not having enough bees that my company decided to get into, into bees. And we'll find out. So I want to talk about just three things that we can do to improve our beekeeping, improve our colonies, improve our colonies' chances of surviving. And real simply, those things are um, alternate your mite treatments, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, coordinate monitoring, coordinated monitoring. Just what KV was talking about earlier with the BIP teams. If, if you're not in there and you're not on top of the colonies here and you're getting an idea of what's going on inside those colonies, you're going to be playing catch up all the time. And then supplemental nutrition. So let's let's talk about first. Let's talk about this is the easy one about rotating your mite treatments. Um, I was in New Zealand back uh, what was in June. I was in New Zealand and I was talking with the New Zealand beekeepers and I said, "So how are things going? How's your how's uh, you know things going with bees?" And there's oh you know our nutrition is an issue. And they've listed all the same problems that we're having here. Uh, the one thing they're not having a problem with are varroa mites. I said, so is varroa a, a serious issue? And they said, no, no, we treat a couple times a year. They'll do one treatment with fluvalinate, one treatment with amitraz, with uh, an apivar strip. They don't, they don't use anything off-label. And they've got control of their mites. You know, it's, their, mites, their bees are under a lot of stress, just like ours are because they're moving from, um, from the north, north part of the North Island down to the South Island chasing Manuka honey. They chase, the New Zealanders chase Manuka like we chase almonds. They're, they're constantly moving their bees, trying to get to uh, you know, the next resource for Manuka. One a really high grade box of Manuka honey can go for as much as $10,000. $10,000. A little eight ounce bottle of Manuka honey in Singapore or up in, in Malaysia can go for as much as 125, 200 bucks. It's just, a, it's unreal, unreal. And everybody's chasing the honey now and, and beekeepers are, we have colonies stolen, they have honey stolen. Somebody will go through and just rip honey out of colonies. The interesting thing is that Manuka honey is not easy to extract. It's not like an easy extracting thing. It's thixotropic, which means it's, it uh, sets up like gel in the cells. And they have these machines with little fingers that go in and, and agitate the honey in the cell. And then they put it in the centrifuge and they can extract it. It's a lot of work. But I, evidently, it, at that kind of price, it's, it's worth it. Um, but they don't have the issues with, with um, the mites that we have. The mites really aren't causing them a problem. Two mite treatments a year. Are, is enough to keep the mites under control. Uh, fluvalinate still works for them, so they just rotate apivar and fluvalinate. Sometimes they'll use uh, formic acid or oxalic, and uh, but they don't, they're not having issues. And the the big thing about it is is that they're using stuff that's on label, and they're and they're rotating. From the first time varroa mite arrived in their country, they. They, st they recommended a rotation and gave the beekeepers a chance to do rotations, and they haven't had resistance developing. Uh, two weeks ago, I was up in Alberta at the Alberta State Beekeepers Meeting. I was talking to beekeepers up there, and some of them are going back to fluvalinate because they found they've got susceptibility in the mites again. And so they're, they're going back to one treatment a year with fluvalinate mm -hmm. and getting at that time, they're getting 95% knockdown. And then they rotate another treatment in. And uh, so they're, they're having more luck up there than we are down here with their treatments. And I think it all comes from rotating your treatments and not building up resistance to any one product. But we need to start thinking about, you know, using uh, an amitraz-based product along with softer treatments. At Wonderful, we did a, a study this, this last fall 
looking at oxalic acid, amitraz as a, as a grease patty, and the apivar strips. And in monitoring the mites, looking at live mite knockdown with uh, uh, doing a sugar shake, and, a, uh, and also sticky board monitoring, we found that the apivar strips were working better than the amitraz that we're putting in, it appeared that the amitraz would give a quick knockdown, but not a continued uh, knockdown the way the apivar strips did. So we had really good luck with the apivar strips. We used oxalic acid at the same time and had almost, um, well, not almost no uh, effect, but it was very low effect, primarily because we still had brood in the colonies. And so I'm looking at oxalic and formic and maybe even essential oils as springtime treatments after we make our splits or while we're making our splits, use something like that and then keep the harder treatment, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the amitraz, the apivar strips for the fall when we really have to be certain that we have good clean bees. So I, I would definitely recommend, you know, looking at, at ways and something that works for you just because it may work for your neighbor, doesn't mean that it necessarily works for you. Find a system that works for you, but you have to monitor. You have to be in there routinely monitoring and looking at what the effect is and find what works for you. Okay, um, the next thing I want to talk about is just a, a coordinated monitoring program. And I can't say enough about the tech trend. I, I'm sure you, you got tired of hearing Kaylee talking about the tech transfer teams in the last talk, but I can't say enough about the work that they're doing and the, and the style of um, data that comes out of it and the quality of data that comes out of it and the accessibility to you, the beekeeper. You can make real-time decisions based on, how many people in here use the tech transfer or have a tech transfer team that comes around? You got one hand. Think about it. Oh, two. Okay. You need to. You want to do a sales job here? <laughs> <laughs> so, what they do for you is they, you know, it's it's a chance to evaluate your hives and really see what's going on in there. They give you a a, a really good detailed view of what's going on inside your hives. They provide you with real-time information that you can make decisions with. And that's what you as a beekeeper need. You don't need you know, to send in a sample and a month later get a response. You're getting real-time information back to you. And of course, all your information is held in confidence, but at the same time, you're compared against everything that's going on in the nation. So you can see where you're ranking with everybody else. And not, not by name, though. We don't know how Russell's colonies are really doing until he tells us. <laughs> anyway, so this, you know, this is, this is one of the, uh, this is the hygienic uh, testing they do. They put a uh, PVC pipe over some brood, freeze it with liquid nitrogen, and check and see how fast the, the bees remove it. If you start looking at, at that, you're going to find that your, uh, you're going to be selecting for stock that is more hygienic. In hygienic behavior, not only are you you're looking at something that will take care of mites, but you know, with hygienic behavior comes resistance to American fall brood, European fall brood. The bees are more hygienic, less susceptible to, this, to diseases. You know, we don't hear as much about American fall brood today as we did years ago. And I think a lot of that is due to are selecting for more hygienic bees. You know, Rothenbuehler back in the in the 60s and early early 70s, late 70s even, was working on at Rothenbuehler, Ohio State, was working on hygienic bees to uh, control American fowl brood, and he was able to select bees that were high, were uh, American fowl brood resistant. You could put in frames of disease frames of brood in that colony, and they clean it up, and it was all on hygienic behavior. They were nasty little bees to work with, but they were hygienic. <laughs> <laughs> Can't have everything. Yeah. So, and if, you, if you're not interested in hiring the whole tech transfer team to come and do the work for you, you can do the work yourself. 
the remote transfer teams, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, okay? The remote check transfer teams, you're, you're being trained as a, as a, a re, uh, researcher yourself. They'll come, they'll train you in how to take the samples, how to do the, uh, the hygienic behavior work, how to do all of the sampling, and you send the samples to them, and you get data back from the lab. How long does it take to turn around, usually? Seven to 10 days? Yeah. So it's, it, it, the cost is a lot less, you're doing the work, uh, and you're, you're learning in the process. I would highly recommend you know, doing the training and, and, uh, and learning to do the, the sampling yourself because you're gonna be a better beekeeper you know, for doing that. It's gonna give you a better understanding of what's going on in your, inside your colonies by better understanding. And you've got access to these people, all these, these brand new people in, in uh, College Park, Maryland, and <coughs> up in North Dakota, Minnesota, everywhere else, you've got access to them. So they'll, they'll respond to you. you. You can ask questions. There's a blog that goes with it. There's a newsletter too, isn't there? There's a blog, right? There's a blog. There's a blog. No newsletter yet? What have you been doing? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you get the specialized training. Um, and you, you, know, you get the reports, uh, the, the individualized reports for your, for your stuff. So you can, you can do the sampling yourself. And this is a, uh, an example of the kinds of reports you get with the information. Um, number of mites, you know, mites per thousand, for 100 bees. You're uh, trying to see all the, the nosema levels, all that kind of good stuff you're getting. This is, this is one for one of our yards on it at Wonderful. And it's invaluable to be able to go down through this and see not just, you know, your, your average spore levels, but your high and your low spore levels too. What's the variance? How, what kind of variance are you getting in your, in your spore loads with nosema? How about your mite levels? You know, you, you, your average mite level might be 1.5 mites per, per 100 bees, but do I have a variance where it's real high on one end and low on the other? Um, you need to know that. This kind of data comes to you and you can say, well, I've got a lot of, I'm getting some high ones, but mostly I'm low. Let's take a look at what we can do about the outliers. It gives you data that you can really work with. So monitoring is, is something you really, you're not gonna, there's nothing that's gonna take the place of good, strong monitoring in your colony. Okay, nutrition is something else you can take control of. There's a lot of things we feel like we don't have control of in our colonies. But nutrition now, with all the different products out there, you go through the, the, uh, the area out there where all the vendors are, and you're gonna see how many different kinds of patties, how many different kinds of product, all these kinds of, of things are available. You can take control of the nutrition that goes in your colony. And it's important because you can time your, your brood population. We're having problems, we're in a, a state where the four years of, of drought, if anybody knows about supplemental feeding, we in California know about supplemental feeding. Because if you're not supplemental feeding out here, you're either you're in a pristine area that you've got an unlimited well or something, I don't know, because everywhere is challenged. So <coughs> nutritional supplementation allows you the ability to stimulate your colony and get your, your brood population where you want it, when you want it. And that's something you need to be looking at in your colonies too. When I teach a class at Cal Poly, I take the kids out, I open up the colony, I hand them frames out of the, out of the colony and say, here, here, tell me what you see. And they look at it and they say, well, I see brood. And I say, okay, well, what kind of brood do you see? And so then they, they describe where they see you know, cap brood. I say, how much larva? How many eggs? What's your ratio of eggs to larva to pupae? What's going on in this colony? Where is that curve going? Is it going up or is it coming down? You can, you can adjust that curve, whether your colony is growing at an exponential curve that you want it to grow. You want your colony to be in that growth phase until it's time to shut them down. Now, when it's time to shut them down, you want to still make sure that they have protein because the bees that, as the queen is shutting down in the fall, 
your nurse bee to brood ratio shifts. Early in the summer, and when the colony is growing exponentially, you've got a high number of nurse, a high number of larvae and nurses. As the as the shifts, as the queen stops laying eggs, it shifts. Now you've got more nurse bees than you've got brood in the colony. And what that shift does is now you've got bees doing what they normally do. When a, when a bee emerges from its cell, it goes into it eats protein. Hypopharyngeal glands, the, the royal jelly glands, start producing royal jelly, and they start feeding it to the larva. But when you've got a very small number of larva in the colony, that's a good thing because those larvae are going to be really fat and well fed, but those nurse bees still have extra royal jelly, and they're going, what do we do with this stuff? What do we do with this stuff? <laughs> and so here, Russell, you have something. And they start sharing it around the colony, and all the workers in the colony start getting this royal jelly from those nurses that are, that are producing too much royal jelly for the larvae that are there, and protein levels in the colony start coming up. As protein levels come up, the bees, there's genes in their body that activate to produce vitalogenin, this lipid protein carbohydrate uh, mix that they store as like a fat in their body, and that's winter stores. And so that's the fat bees. So when you when you feed, when you when you're getting ready for fall, you need to think about have, have my bees got enough food to build that royal jelly, to build that vitalogenin, to to send them into the winter. Bees with vital higher vitalogen levels live long. Just that simple. Protein equals longevity. And you've got the ability to feed protein to them. The other thing I think is really cool, and I mention this every time I see this picture, that's how bees eat protein supplement. One lick at a time. <coughs> when you put a one pound patty in the colony, that one pound patty disappears one lick at a time by thousands and thousands of bees. But they literally lick it until it dissolves. They add a little saliva to it, a little nectar, a little water, dissolve it, and take it up the honey tongue and either digest it or share it in the colony. But that's how, that's how bees eat everything. So it's important what you're feeding them, that it's the right particle size, so they can. So when you're feeding your bees, open up the colony. Look at the bottom board. See if there's a lot of trash on the bottom board from your, your patties. Because if there's a lot of trash on the bottom, it means they're not able to eat everything. And that's money that you're spending. So it'll give you an idea of what, what's going on inside the hive. But protein equals longevity. So this is a this is a sort of a statement on, on what protein is in the colony. The highest level of protein in a bee is in the in the young bees, three to twelve days old. Those are the nurse bees. And those bees have the highest protein levels in their body. And they only they have that high level and they can start producing royal jelly because they have that high protein level. <laughs> Age of first foraging is affected by the protein levels in the bee. If a bee doesn't, if, as protein levels in the bee starts to drop, juvenile hormone levels increase, and the bee change transitions out of the hive into the field. So nest duties are cut short. If you've got bees that are, are poorly fed or undernourished, those bees transition into field bees sooner than they would if they had higher protein levels. Moving out into the, into the field early does nothing more than shorten the, life, the time in the hive. When you shorten that time in the hive, then you haven't got as many nurses taking care of the brood and all. They go out into the field and start working early and they're gonna die young as well because their protein levels run out. And bees, once they start foraging, they don't eat protein anymore. They don't go out and eat pollen. Once bees start foraging, they don't eat pollen. So you want your adult bees, to, what you can affect is the longevity of those adult bees. The longer the field bee lives, the greater the overlap in the populations because a colony of bees is nothing more than a series of overlapping generations. And the, the more overlap there is in the, in the adult bees, in the, in, the, in the bees in the generations, 
the longer the individual B lives, the greater overlap there is in the population. The greater overlap, the bigger the population. So you want bees that, that live longer. I worked with a beekeeper, gosh, and I, I ran into him years, uh, a year ago in Michigan. Um, Jay DeCorn, he was a, a blueberry pollinator, and I worked with him when I was in graduate school. And his father was a beekeeper back in the 20s and 30s. And Jay's dad pulled me aside when I was doing my graduate work. And he said, you know the problem with bees today? And I said, tell me. And he said, the adult bees are not living as long as they need to. Back then, he recognized this. He said, something happened after 1945. That's the introduction of, of modern pesticides. He says, the, our populations, I just, we just can't get the populations in the colonies that we used to have. And so this is something that's going on. And we have so many more challenges today than we had back in 1976 when I did my graduate work. Don't do the math, OK? <laughs> um, but we've got raw mites. We've got tracheal mites. We've got gosh knows how many different viruses that we never had a problem with before. And they're being vectored around by these little vampires that go running around in our colonies. So that's what's that's what's affecting the longevity of our bees. And protein dynamics in the colony can affect that longevity. So that's something that you have control over. You can put protein in at the key times in the colony and increase the longevity of the bees. I did a study when I was down in Tucson um, looking at feeding supplemental protein in a colony uh, continually and what effect that had on nurse bees moving out of the out of the colony into the field. I tracked the young bees and basically what happened is the control colonies got no supplemental protein, the treatment colonies got supplemental protein, the bees that got the supplemental protein, the nurse bees stayed in the hive longer than the, the bees that didn't get the supplemental protein. Even though there was natural pollen coming in, there's plenty of natural pollen coming in, but the field bees weren't eating, they weren't getting the protein. I think what happens when you feed the supplemental protein, hygienic behavior kicks in and all the bees start eating the stuff to get rid of it. And protein levels in the colony increase because more royal jelly is produced than the bees really need. And that gets shared around in the hive and those field bees get some of that royal jelly and they can digest that. So protein levels were up. Protein levels in those field bees stayed higher longer than the controls. Um, and to corroborate that, I just two weeks ago I was up in, in uh, Alberta and there was a researcher there at the Beaver, Beaver Lodge research station. And he was doing a study where he fed supplemental protein. And he, instead of looking at protein levels in the colony, he was just looking at square inches of brood in the colony. And colonies that had routine supplemental protein had higher uh, brood levels, had higher, maintained higher brood levels than colonies that, that didn't get it. Um, there was a guy, I can't remember, out of Tucson back in 1979 did a study, Dwyer I think was his name, and he did a study where he fed a colony supplemental feed year round. And the colony that got, the colonies that got fed supplemental protein year round produced, they had no higher populations than the other colonies. B for B, they produced more honey. The, the colonies that got fed supplemental protein, B for B, when you, when you adjusted the populations in the colonies, B for B, they produced 19% more honey than the colonies that didn't get the protein. Now, how did they do that? You know, they, they didn't have bigger buckets to carry the honey in. What happened is those bees, they lived longer. The field bees lived longer. So there you, could, there you had more field bees in the field carrying, you know, being able to forage and produce more honey. So you have the control. You, you're able to get this. Thank you. So Dr. Gordon, uh, so they fed the, the continuous feeding of the protein and then at times of the year when food was low, they would feed supplemental sugars as well? Or? 
Oh, you, when you're feeding protein, you need to balance your <coughs> carbohydrates and your protein. Okay, in the it was, it was when you're feeding, yeah. Okay.